welcome to this lecture sponsored by the Institute of World Politics. For those of you who are new, IWP is a graduate school of national security, intelligence, and international affairs. We offer a doctoral program, seven master's degree programs, including two online MAs, and 18 certificates of graduate study. If you're interested in learning more about us, please feel free to speak to one of our staff at the conclusion of this event, or you can visit iwp.edu. We'd like to thank uh, all of our supporters who make our events possible. Uh, to support the work of IWP, please visit iwp.edu forward slash donate. Today we'll be hearing from Mr. James Carter, who will give a lecture entitled The Perspective of an American Advisor to Putin's Transition Team. Uh, Mr. Carter is a senior fellow with the America First Policy Institute's Center for American Prosperity. Previously, as director, he oversaw the center's operations, including research and policy development impacting economic growth, tax, and budget policy, regulation, trade, and labor productivity. For nearly a decade, he was vice president of government affairs at Emerson, a diversified global manufacturing and technology company based in uh, St. Louis, Missouri. In addition to managing Emerson's global, federal, and state government affairs, Mr. Carter's lobbying portfolio included tax policy, international trade, and management of the company's political action committee. Before joining Emerson, Mr. Carter served in the Bush and Clinton administrations as a senior staff member on the Senate Budget Committee and as a policy advisor to former Senators John Ashcroft, Sam Brownback, and Connie Mack. He served as a deputy undersecretary at the Department of Labor, a deputy assistant secretary at the Department of Treasury, and associate director of the National Economic Council at the White House. While at the Treasury Department, he received the Secretary of the Treasury's Exceptional Service Award and a separate award for his work on behalf of the Jobs and Growth Tax Relief Reconciliation Act of 2003. Mr. Carter has been published more than 200 times on fiscal policy, economics, and other public policy matters for leading publications including Wall Street Journal, Forbes, Investors Business Daily, Politico, The Hill, The Daily Caller, and USA Today. He's a frequent speaker, including as an adjunct professor at the George Washington University and as a lecturer in the public management program at Johns Hopkins University. He's a 2014 recipient of John Hopkins University's Excellence in Teaching Award, and he also appeared in season three of House of Cards, playing a U.S. Senator. Uh, he recently served on the board of directors for both the Missouri Chamber of Commerce and the National Capital Chapter of the Alzheimer's Association. He's a former president of the Business Government Relations Council, a nonprofit organization that seeks to increase governmental awareness of the role of business in national affairs. He holds degrees from George Mason University and Truman State University. Now, please join me in welcoming Mr. James Carter. Thank you. Well, I, need, I have to shorten that bio. It's a little too long. <laughs> but I just want to say thank you uh, to the Institute of World Politics for having me here today, uh, giving me the opportunity uh, to speak with you and share my story. Uh, I must add that these are my personal views and not necessarily those of the America First Policy Institute. So much of what I'm planning to say tonight isn't really known outside of a small circle of people in the know. So I hope you find these uh, behind the scenes stories insightful and if nothing else, entertaining. So let's begin. So uh, in 1998, I worked for Senator John Ashcroft of Missouri. I was his budget and tax aide. Uh, I came in the office one day and learned that President Clinton had called for a 73% increase in aid to Russia. Now, at this point, Boris Yeltsin was president. Uh, they were trying to move towards the West, trying to liberalize their economy, but they were having a, a tough go of it. So I th thought about that for a bit, and it occurred to me what we need is more trade with Russia, not more aid, necessarily. In fact, at the time, we traded more with certain Caribbean islands than we did Russia. So I came up with an idea. I came up with the idea of IRFTA, the U.S.-Russian Free Trade Agreement. So I sat down, I wrote something out. I did my research and realized that 
a trade would be beneficial. But again, I was only 29 years of, of age. Uh, I needed someone with more credibility. So I reached out to a friend of mine, Senator Bob Packwood, the former chairman of the Senate Finance Committee. And so the senator and I did this op-ed together that appeared March 2nd, 1998 in the Journal of Commerce. Now we had one prediction in here. We thought that given what the government was doing with its high yield short term debt, they may find themselves in a financial crisis. Now the Asian financial crisis wasn't too much earlier. We thought, well, Russia might be poised for one themselves. Well, guess what happened? 160 days after we published our piece, the Russian financial crisis hit the fan. That led to an, <laughs> more of crisis for the economy. Um, so fast forward two years. I'm at my desk working for the Joint Economic Committee for Senator Connie Mack. My boss calls. He says, Jim, what did you do? I'm like, what do you mean what I do? He says, you're getting a call today from the US Embassy in Moscow. Oh, OK. Well, that's good to know. <sighs> Long story short. Andrei, Andrei Ilyanov, uh, the senior economic advisor to President-elect Putin, had seen our piece and had asked for us, for, for me, by name, to join a USAID uh, team heading to Russia later that month to help with the Putin transition project. So I got this letter from the ambassador, invited me. And I briefly wondered, was this meant for Jimmy Carter, President Carter? Why is it coming to me? <laughs> uh, so ultimately, there were two groups of economists that uh, went to Russia uh, on behalf of the United States. I was one of six in the first group. Now, mind you, I was only 31 at the time. And the next oldest person on the team uh, was the former and future finance minister of Peru. So <laughs> from April uh, 15th to the 22nd, we went to Russia, meeting with uh, the outgoing Yeltsin team, meeting the incoming Putin team, meeting the World Bank advisors, and, and others. So eventually, this culminated having lunch uh, with this man right here. <laughs> that, that's me. That's, that's Putin. Um, but more about uh, that lunch a little later. Um, but let me start with talking about the political conditions that they faced and we faced going there in April of 2000. Uh, in fact, I found my notes, uh, thankfully, from 24 years ago. So apparently, after years of half measures, uh, the economy was in bad shape. Uh, there were arguably uh, corrupt reforms, poorly, defined, uh, poorly designed reforms. Uh, it was very disruptive and didn't really help matters. Now, the worst part of this is these reforms were viewed as liberal market reforms, and people blamed them for Russia's economic woes. Liberal policies were discredited. In fact, when I was there, some of the people we spoke with in power were advocating return to the Soviet command and control model to rebuild the military industrial complex Russia had had. So, when we were there, uh, Andre, again, the, the economic advisor, uh, wanted us to do three things. First was to educate the country about what reforms should be undertaken. Secondly, he wanted us to be cheerleaders for liberal policies, basically saying, don't be afraid. It can be done. It has been done elsewhere. And finally, to help build support and momentum to overcome bureaucratic stonewalling. So now let's talk about the economic conditions we encountered when we got there. Well, the 90s weren't kind in terms of unemployment for Russia. As you can see, unemployment uh, increased pretty much every, each and every year in the 90s. It had just started to come down um, after the uh, 98 um, financial and, uh, crisis. So unemployment was on its way down, but still relatively high. Now, the big problem was inflation. I don't, no, I don't think you can see this, but this says 900% here. And actually, the year before, it was over 2,000%. <laughs> so uh, inflation was on its way down. But the year before Putin took office, it was still 85%, OK? I mean, it, compared to 900, it's an improvement, but it's still 85%. So that's a problem. 
Uh, more importantly, this uh, chart looks at per capita GDP in real terms in Russia. Uh, you'll note that from 1990 to 1989, real capita, uh, uh, per capita GDP fell 43%. That is far worse than the US Great Depression, 43%. Uh, it can be argued at that point um, that Russia was a third world country with nukes, or maybe even a gas station with nukes. It's hard to say. Uh, but the, the economy was in bad shape. Let's put it in this context. Russia's GDP today is roughly equivalent of New York State's GDP, just, just under $2 trillion. Uh, yet, mind you, Russia has 144 million population compared to less than 20 million in New York State. So with a 7.4 times greater population, they have roughly the same economic output. So then, uh, the Russians had five objectives that they you know, wanted us to work on with them. Uh, the first was a structural reform of their economy. Now, what does that mean? Basically, they wanted to introduce market-driven competition and cease direct and indirect subsidies uh, to the very in, uh, unproductive uh, um, 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 businesses there. Secondly, they wanted to improve the investment climate. They literally said, it's the highest priority for the coming years, both to generate more investment internally and to attract more foreign direct investment into Russia. Social policy targeted at the support of structural reform. Now, what does that mean? Basically, it means retraining laborers and reallocating uh, labor throughout the country. Again, they had a lot of people working in the coal industry, for instance, and they slashed that number by yeah, about a million people, I believe reallocating those, those uh, workers to work elsewhere. Strengthening of governmental institutions is something else they talked about. Uh, that's basically, what, there's more to it, but largely strengthening judicial uh, and law enforcement institutions, trying to fight corruption. And then the fifth, integration of Russia into the world economy. The, these five were the priorities, the objectives that we were told to work on. Now, fortunately, uh, these objectives fit very nicely with the advice we were about to give them. So um, I have five keys to economic prosperity. And in fact, um, I'm going to read from my notes here because this is verbatim what I told them and, uh, and they heard. Well, at least I hope they heard. So competitive markets. Competition is the disciplining force of a market economy. Producers must produce efficiently and provide consumers with desired goods and services or be driven from the market. The process improves both products and production methods. It directs scarce resources to activities that produce more value. Unfortunately, governments frequently employ subsidies, regulations, price controls, and trade barriers to, quote, protect the economy from the discipline imposed by the competition. Indeed, those, these restrictions stifle competition and retard economic growth. Now, now, uh, I would say related to this, we emphasize at every turn the importance of allowing businesses to fail. Again, you know, subsidies and tariffs that prop up businesses that, that ought to be not in operation should be abolished. Allowing businesses to fail releases those resources and allows them to be used more efficiently elsewhere. You want to, to allow resources to rise to their highest valued use. So that was rid of markets. Limited government. Governments can enhance economic growth by providing an infrastructure for the smooth operation of markets. This includes maintaining a legal system capable of protecting people and property and maintaining a monetary system that provides price stability. Governments impede economic growth, however, when they impose high and poorly devised taxes, enact onerous regulations, pursue widespread income redistribution, or engage in activities best left to the private sector. Something a little different for, for Russia. Monetary stability. Yep. Oftentimes, people don't really realize the importance of monetary stability because sound money is vital to the functioning of the market economy because prices convey vital information about individual preferences and global conditions. To the extent that government distorts this information through manipulation or simple monetary mismanagement, prices lose their utility and prudent economic decision-making becomes increasingly difficult. 
When people can no longer express their preferences or intentions and expect to be understood, resources are inevitably misdirected throughout the economy. If we have 85% inflation, by God, you don't have monetary stability. Security property rights. Private ownership holds people accountable for their actions. With private ownership, each economic participant faces the cost of using scarce resources. To enrich themselves, people must bid away resources from each other and provide customers goods and services more valuable than the cost of production. People are thus encouraged to use economic resources productively to discover and undertake actions that generate economic growth. And finally, freedom to trade with foreigners. Specialization and international trade are by design mutually advantageous. International trade markets, the international trade makes it possible for people to benefit from specializing in those goods and services they produce more efficiently. By selling the goods they specialize in so as to purchase goods produced more efficiently abroad, each trading partner produces and consumes more than would otherwise be possible. So again, this is exactly the language we provided the Russian government 24 years ago. In short, our message is economic freedom. Okay, back to the lunch. So we met President Putin for lunch on April 21st of 2000. Good Friday, as it were. Um, we were I remember sitting there waiting in the lobby uh, for the president to, to uh, bring us in. And one of my colleagues was literally telling Stalin jokes. We were like, Richard, no Stalin jokes. <laughs> we weren't quite sure if we'd get out of there. Uh, but, uh, oh well, that was fun. So, uh, because we knew we had limited time with the president, uh, each of us, and again, well, this is Andre, by the way, uh, uh, the advisor, and the, and the six of us, one, two, three, four, five, yeah, there were six of us, um, yeah, here you go. Um, um, uh, divvied up our time. We, could, we each was, okay, we have you know, X number of minutes to speak. Um, and so um, we started. Uh, now, President Putin speaks Russian and German, but not English. So we had a translator in the room. And after a while, Andre got upset with the translator and had him tossed out. I don't know exactly what happened. I just know he was no longer there in the room. Andre took over and uh, translated because he speaks uh, Russian and English. So um, this brings me to my part of the story, which actually features a Yugo, of all things. I, I, who here remembers the Yugo? Remember Yugo? Yeah? OK, good. Some, some people know Yugos. Yeah, as you may know, Yugo uh, well, is a very poorly manufactured car. Uh, from 1980 until 2008, um, and it's, it plays a, a role in my comments to the president. Hey, Lola. So um, I wanted to convey the notion that, it, that it's important to have all five of those five elements I, I outlined, you know, the, uh, 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 competition, living in government, freedom of trade foreigners, that sort of thing. And I made the point that if you have, you know, four of the five, but not all five, or three of the five, you're not going to get the, get the performance you thought you would want to get out of an economy. I gave the example of having a, a fine sports car, okay? A, a, a fine sports car, but with the engine of a Yugo. I said, you're not going to get the performance you expected out of that sports car. And so uh, Andre translated that. Uh, President Andre went back and forth for a minute. And then um, uh, Andre said, uh, the president wants to know, what's a Yugo? <laughs> I've never heard of a Yugo which I, I assumed, you know, Yugoslavia and all, he would know. But, uh, oh well. Uh, that actually does remind me of a funny Reagan joke uh, that I thought I would tell now, because why not? Ah. So, uh, in Soviet Russia, Reagan said, a man goes to buy a car. He goes up to the owner and asks for the car, to which the owner responds, well, you know, there is a 10-year waiting limit. So the man says, OK. And after some time, he then agreed to buy the car. So he pays for the car in advance. And just before he leaves, he asks the owner, can I pick up the car in the morning or afternoon? And, uh, and, so, and, and so the guy selling the car says, it's 10 years away. What does it matter when you morning or afternoon? And the man says, well, the plumber's coming in the morning. <laughs> so. Yeah, that, that, that was one of Reagan's favorite jokes. So I wanted to toss it in there. So, uh, but in addition to these broad 
principles they were outlined in the course of the explanations why we were putting forth these principles. We also came up with some concrete proposals. Uh, we produced two books, uh, the red version in uh, Russian and the blue uh, version in English, where we outlined uh, some concrete proposals. So uh, the one that really stands out in my mind is tax reform. Now, one could argue that Russia had created the worst of all worlds. They had high tax rates and very low revenue. They were on the wrong side of the Laffer curve, in other words. So when I say high rates, I mean high rates. They had a 41% payroll tax. OK, can you imagine that? And, uh, and, per and personal income tax rates up to 80%. So we, uh, well, in fact, given those high rates, there was a popular joke at the time that uh, so long as they pretend to pay us, we will, we will pretend to work. <laughs> So we proposed a 13% flat tax as parts of, uh, of our package. And, um, and actually, that's one thing they did do. Within months, they had passed it. And January 1st of 2001, uh, Russia had itself a 13% flat tax. Is that an income? Yeah. Personal income tax. Personal income tax, yes. So what's the aftermath of all of this? Well, we came back uh, to the US, and there were some articles written. Uh, about our trip over there, and let's see here. Oh yes, and in the first year, uh, the uh, uh, tax revenue from our 13% flat tax jumped 26% in real terms. So what we said would work actually did work. Now, unfortunately, Andre uh, fought for years to push for free market policies, market-driven policies. And in 2005, resigned and left Russia for good. Um, in, fact, in fact, I think he lives in, D, in, the, in the DC area. Um, but what happened uh, after we left? Oh, yeah. Uh, Andre said, Russia is no longer politically free, run by state corporations, acting their own, in, acting their own interests. It's one thing to work for a country that is partly free. Another thing, when the political system has changed and the country has stopped being free and democratic. So unfortunately, um, even though Andre was there pushing for market policies, market reforms, uh, Russia remains unfree. Now, this is a chart from the Heritage Foundation's Index of Economic Freedom. Uh, and I'm sorry to say that actually they became less free in the, in, in the two years following our visit than they were prior to our visit. Uh, and they vacillated between uh, mostly unfree and repressed. Today. Russia is the 125th most free of 175 countries. So I can't say we really push the deal there all that much. But let's see what the outcomes were. Oh, yes. OK, so um, in 2023, uh, Heritage cites corruption, lack of judicial independence, disrespect for private property rights, and state interference for why they are so unfree. Now, let's see the outcomes. Um, this is unemployment. Uh, 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 so as you can tell, unemployment has been falling over time with a, a noticeable spike there uh, with the uh, 2008 uh, global economic uh, crisis. But it has remained suddenly high, but it, it's, it's getting down there. Uh, by the way, all this is, 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 uh, is uh, World Bank data, by the way, all, all findable online. Uh, inflation, well, as you can tell, again, 900%. This looks pretty good, right? Well, if you actually dig down deep, I, I lopped off the earlier years, you'll still notice that double-digit inflation has ravaged Russia for a good part of um, well, the last 20 years. So that's, that's not good. Uh, and this is per capita GDP uh, in Russia. Um, actually, in the years following uh, the implementation of the flat tax, Russia did see some good uh, uh, growth, it did see some good growth. Uh, following 2008, uh, they have really slowed uh, quite a bit, however. Again, they've not implemented the policies they would need to get economic growth. So I asked myself, what if? What if they had actually implemented the sort of things that we had advised? So again, this is the Index of Economic Freedom showing that, you know, again, mostly in free or repressed. But let's take an example of, say, Poland. Poland actually was more repressed than Russia back in the day, but then moved much more strongly into free market policies. 
And I think the results are, well, telling. So back in the day, Poland's per capita GDP, uh, well, Russia's was 24, let's see here, let me find this. Where did I find it? Oh, here it is. Yeah, in 1990, Russia's per capita GDP was 59% greater than Poland's, okay? Uh, today, Russia's per capita GDP has increased 24% from that point, but Poland's has tripled. And today, Poland's per capita GDP is 71% greater than Russia's. So these policies work. So is it any wonder why in Poland, 85% of those surveyed recently supported the shift to capitalism, with only 8% saying no, that was a bad thing to do. By contrast, in Russia, only 38% uh, welcome the system they currently have that some uh, falsely call a market economy. So uh, I'll leave you with this, and then I'll open this up for questions. I'll leave you with this. If Russia had taken our policies, grown organically, become prosperous on, the, on their own, they would be trading with their neighbors and not invading their neighbors. At least that's what I'd like to think. With that being said, uh, I'll take any questions you might have. Thank you. Sir. Hmm. Very interesting. Um, the package of the case against the uh, KGB was able to monopolize most of the industry when they were de-statified. They, they basically took over and they run them as oligarchs and monopolies. Had you recommended that there be some sort of antitrust implementation rather than non-interference by the government mm -hmm. in the private industry, would that have changed things? Hmm. Good question. Uh, certainly an anti-corruption um, focus was, was part of what we talked about and, and part of what the Russian uh, uh, um, advisors we spoke with wanted. Um, but uh, you're right, uh, uh, the, the rise of the oligarchs, it, it, in part is because the way privatization was done, it was done improperly. Um, and it, it wasn't Margaret Thatcher's privatization, we'll put it that way. Uh, if they had privatized like Margaret Thatcher had in, in, in Britain, we might have seen something very different. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yeah. <laughs> um, today, with Russia, despite the war, despite the economic sanctions, uh, goods persist. Production, mm. the salaries are growing, the um, basically people are, people are going out more to the restaurants, some people call it. Uh, military sanctions, some people say no, it was different reasons. But how long do you think Russia can uh, keep growing and instead of failing as all of us expected when the war started and Russia all the time expansions were starting at the same time? Okay. So two things come to mind. First of all, of course, the impact of uh, oil prices on Russia are, are key. Um, they have made billions uh, off of uh, uh, oil prices. Uh, at the same time, they've also shifted to more of a wartime uh, footing, a wartime economy. Um, but again, uh, that can only be kept up for so long. I, Marie, do you know? <laughs> Yes. Um, we're not really seeing some of the problems there. The other thing I was just going to say is I, I went to Russia on a project uh, with a U.S. State Department grant um, about 20 years ago, and it was in the area of tourism. Uh, the, the country doesn't didn't really have a robust tourism sector, and what I was I was just going to say that I learned about that is that. Um, People really didn't know anything about business and break-even analysis, mm. so they didn't know how to make money. And I think the interesting thing that I gleaned from that was that uh, the people that were the oligarchs or the KGB people were the same people that now were going to become business people. And from my experience in traveling in the organization of American Council of Young Political Leaders, mm -hmm. I saw the same thing. Um, because what happens is everybody thinks these are different. I mean, one day you're one person, the next day you're 
different, but it's still that hierarchy and that leadership. So it's really hard to get away from that. Thank you very much for uh, uh, your great presentation. Uh, Andrei Kostelov, actually, it's not far from here, so you're okay. Uh, Good guy. Uh, I uh, wanted to ask you, how do you explain this uh, exact graph? Uh, you see the period of uh, stable and, uh, and pretty successful growth of 68% uh, mm -hmm. in the year 2007-2008. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, then uh, President Medvedev came office and uh, he is known for uh, at least trying to do economic liberalization and to be even closer with the West and more integration with the West. Uh, uh, but still, uh, this curve mm -hmm. becomes on, almost flat. So there is a period of very long stagnation, which didn't change after Putin came back to mm -hmm. office. It didn't change when he annexed Crimea. It didn't change when he uh, started the war. Um, and uh, at the same graph, you see Poland and many other countries, which are extremely examples of post-Soviet countries, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, and it would be stable growth. What's your explanation? Two thoughts come to mind. First, it's convergence theory. Um, given the drop off that you had in per capita GDP, um, uh, it, it was almost, in, almost inevitable that uh, Russia would then converge uh, um, to a point. Now, as, as you know, uh, economic growth is a function of getting people into the labor force, educating them, arming them with the tools to be productive. Now, I had a chart in here earlier about labor force participation rates in Russia, which I took out, trying to be a little less nerdy. And uh, you'll notice from 2000, uh, from, uh, from 90 until uh, about eight, uh, 98 or so, there was a huge drop off in labor force participation in Russia. And I think it's fairly well established that someone who doesn't work doesn't produce anything. And so long as they're not producing something, it doesn't show up in the GDP figures. So uh, then if you look at after uh, 2000, with the reduction in the payroll tax, with the introduction of the flat tax, you saw people getting back into the labor force again, earning, producing, and that was a, a good thing. It was a virtuous cycle. Um, but uh, that, that plateaued. I mean, it's, it's partly a function of demographics, certainly. Uh, and also the fact that you have uh, a, a shrinking uh, labor force uh, in uh, Russia, which again, getting more people working, arming them to be productive. If, if, if people aren't working and being productive, you don't see the GDP figure. So that, that's, that's my explanation. I think you had a question? Yes. what the gentleman said on, on the current uh, economic data in Russia. What's your take on short-term versus medium-term? I guess short-term war economy could boost up the GDP, but in the medium-term, the sanctions could him, could hit um, you know, further supply of important products to advance the economy, or do you think China could fill that void um, of the products that, let's say, Europe or US are not going to provide any more cost structural change? Sure. Well, in order for Russia to sell the products, they need to produce the products. And again, with a declining uh, labor force, uh, with um, malinvestments in the economy, uh, that to me signals uh, a, a, like, a, a productivity growth. Uh, and so unless there's a change in policy that, you know, to, again, gets more people in the labor force and gives them the tools to be productive and actually a system, again, with, you know, over prices, Function the way they're supposed to function, um, and regulations, you know, are, are, are taken away that you know really make it difficult to do business. Uh, I don't see the, the medium or long term being all that favorable for Russia. Uh, the short term, well, that's the short term, but medium long term, no, I do not. Yes, sir. You mentioned. Uh, <laughs> You mentioned demographics, and uh, the question is if the population is shrinking, uh, is there a plan to make Russia attractive for people to move there and work? And it seems like the odds are low right now, <laughs> I'm just saying that. But uh, if they uh. did move there, what are the products, the kind of products that Russia would make that would be attractive on the international marketplace for them to make and sell nationally? 
besides oil price? That's a very good question. And, and I, I have to say, I have a degree mm -hmm. in economics, and the reason mm -hmm. I mention mm -hmm. that is that it doesn't make me any more popular mm -hmm. at nightclubs and dinner parties <laughs> to ask these people. Ah. Well, I wish I was capable of giving you an answer, uh, I, but I'm not. Sorry, but I thought if anybody in the room would know, you would. <laughs> Charles. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jim. So in the 1990s, I was involved for a while with the Alliance to Save Energy, which was running a program called the uh, Kaliningrad Defense Conversion Initiative. And the, um, the focus was to convert the military armaments and ordnance and uh, military platform factories in Kaliningrad, especially into consumer product manufacturing uh, and plants and facilities. To what extent was your group uh, advising them in, in anything to do with lessening military production and going into consumer? Mm -hmm. So by the time we got there, I believe uh, Russia's military defense spending had, al had already fallen considerably. Um, and uh, as you may remember, the Bush administration put in, into place some programs to purchase uranium and do any number of things to help, you know, uh, uh, well, keep that out of certain hands and to provide Russia uh, with, 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 with some assistance. Um, I personally didn't really talk much about, about that. Um, it, I, I was more of the tax person uh, in the room at the time, uh, but uh, it's a good point. But at that, at, at that point, the, the, the military uh, spending had really gone down quite considerably. And again, people were coming up to me saying, well, we need to go back to the Soviet model of command and control. We need to go back to the military industrial complex. Uh, oh, in fact, here's a fun story, I just remembered. Uh, as I said, we went around Moscow uh, giving talks uh, at various uh, universities and, uh, and places. And one of the funnest uh, was a building that had been the former Communist Party headquarters. And here we are talking about the importance of limited government, uh, free markets, private property, <laughs> the irony of it all. Oh. <laughs> Not everyone. <laughs> Any other questions? Uh, well, thank you so much for having me tonight. Appreciate it.